Good evening. My name is Steve Bears, and I'm uh, the vicar of the Old World Church and the executive director of the Old World Foundation and on behalf of both institutions. I welcome you to our final spring uh, speaker tonight and welcome you to the Old World Church. Um, if you enjoy tonight and want something a little offbeat and fun and historical, for an evening we are uh, is viewing a new program uh, next week, actually next Wednesday, and uh, the program, uh, and for those of you under 21, uh, this is not for you, it's called Have a Beer with Paul Revere, uh, and it's a, a, a fun program uh, led by our own Tom Dietzel, who look, uh, looks remarkably like the young Paul Revere, and it begins in the Green Dragon Tavern uh, down the street. Uh, and you will get to conspire uh, at the Green Dragon and have a beer and a cup of chowder and then uh, Mr. Revere will escort you through his north end and finally up here for an after hours of behind the scenes tour. So if you are uh, interested in that, uh, tickets are available at Eventbrite. We hope this will be successful and we can uh, run it uh, quite often, uh, but we will have information about it um, at the desk as you leave. I'm delighted to have a twofer to uh, offer tonight. Um, we are welcoming uh, a good friend of mine, Bob Allison. Robert J. Allison is a professor and chair of the history department at Suffolk University. He's one of the leading colonial and revolutionary historians uh, in Boston. Uh, also teaches at the Harvard Extension School and uh, was uh, a recipient in 1997 of the Petra Shattuck Excellence in Teaching Award. Uh, he's the author of uh, The Crescent Obscure, The United States in the Muslim World, uh, from uh, 1776 to 1815, and he just, just to be able to give the lecture tonight, uh, he flew back from Morocco, uh, where he was uh, delivering lectures on that topic. Uh, also the author of American Naval Heroes, 1779 to 1820, A Short History of Boston, uh, The Boston Massacre, and uh, he has now put together a wonderful video si uh, series about um, our history. Uh, and uh, so uh, we welcome uh, uh, Bob Allison. And after he speaks, um, with uh, just a, a brief uh, a couple minute intermission, um, we are also going to um, enjoy a performance of a shadow play called Paul Revere's Ride. You, know, you will know the text of the play. It's what makes us famous. It's a uh, long public poem. And it's performed by Noah's New Americans. Uh, they are a, a group of students from uh, West Hartford, from the Noah Webster House, and this is one of their historical programs. And it was a, a wonderful, uh, serendipitous coincidence that uh, they asked to come up and perform their show tonight. Uh, so we'll have a little extra 20-minute uh, program at the end of our lecture. Um, Bob will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll uh, take uh, questions uh, from the audience and uh, then we'll welcome the, uh, uh, the Noah's New Americans up here to uh, perform All Revere's Broad. So with that, uh, Bob, thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us tonight and thank you all for coming. Well, thank, thank you, Reverend Ayers, and all for coming. I was reflecting as I was preparing here tonight that when I was much younger, around the time I, I would actually be raised in the school church. And as I went through the process of confirmation, I actually thought that perhaps being an Episcopal minister would be a wonderful way to spend my life. And things changed. My calling came in a different direction, thinking how proud my mother would be to see me here in front of the congregation in this venerable my calling took me in another direction in the field of history and another serendipity that is happening that brought us here together tonight. And I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about the history of the building. Probably not as interesting as you would get if you came here on the average day or the docents who tell the story of Old North every day, which is a great story or rather the history of its history. You may know, after the Civil War, 
the congregation here in this changing neighborhood. He says, louder, if you're wondering. I'm sorry. After the Civil War, the congregation here in this changing neighborhood wanted to mark the significance of this building by putting on the front of the tower an inscription that this was the tower from which Paul Revere had the lanterns hung that began the American Revolution. And surprisingly enough, this idea of the congregation met with pretty furious argument and opposition from, of all people, an historian named Richard Frothingham. And I don't know, I wouldn't want to tangle with someone named Frothingham, but one thing we get out of this particular encounter is a lesson that really historians probably should not pick fights with members of the clergy. And Frothingham actually did have a good point. He said, this wasn't really Old North. This was Christ Church. And he said it wasn't called Old North until well after the Revolution because there already were several other churches with the name North or meeting houses with the name North. And in fact, the one most often associated with the term Old North was the meeting house that had been the parish or the pulpit of Increase Matter and Cotton Matter, a building that stood at North Square and built in about in the 1670s, really a venerable historic establishment which had been knocked down in December of 1775 by General Hap, who ordered Old North, which was then an abandoned meeting house as the Congregationalists had all left during the British occupation, as well as about a hundred wooden houses knocked down, not out of spite and not because General Howe did not like the matters, although of course there would be good reason for anyone to take that particular position, but because the British and not occupying Boston were in desperate need of fire, this was the main source of heat, both for heating houses as well as for cooking. And I know we could imagine that after the winter we have been through being in Boston without having any heat, and these old wooden buildings would look pretty appealing if you needed to keep warm. Now at the same time as there was Old North Meeting House, there was also a New North Meeting House built in 1714 on um, actually where St. Stephen's Church is today. There was a New North as Old North had uh, outgrown itself. And then in 1721, just a couple of years before this building was erected, a New North Brick Church was built the corner of Middle Street and Wood Street. Now that would be the corner of Hanover and Fleet Streets. And you know, Boston, as you probably is, who here is not from Boston? Okay. Good. We in Boston have a propensity for giving different things the same name, just as a way of weeding out those who can't navigate. Now, I, I live just off Dorchester Street, and that's just a few blocks from Dorchester Avenue. And the old timers in the neighborhood tell me that at one time you wouldn't say street or avenue, you would pronounce Dorchester differently, so people would know whether you were talking about the street or the avenue. It's just something we do so that you'll know, we know who is from here and who, is, who isn't. Reverend Ayers and I both knew who was not from here before you raised your hand. This church, Christ Church, was built in 1723. Now, as I said, uh, Mr. Frothingham, who wrote a number of very useful books on Boston at the time of the Revolution and the history of Charlestown, made some good points, but the rector of Old North, uh, Charles Duane, was not going to let a historian dictate how this church could commemorate its history. And in fact, Reverend Duane had a better history than Mr. Frothingham did. First, the Puritans did not call any building a church. They called the church the congregation, the people who went into the meeting house. The building itself was less important to the Puritans than this community who gathered in the meeting house. Thus, if, the, if um, this was called Old North Church, then clearly this was the building then, and not one of these other meeting houses, which actually by the time this big debate was happening, it all gone the way of all things. Also, Reverend Wayne had the town records. 
1737, in the town records, it mentions the North Church, of which the Dr. Cutler is the rector, and Timothy Cutler was the first rector of Old North, or Christ Church, thus colloquially in 1737 this building was being called Old North, or North Church, it wasn't yet the Old North Church. 1768, there's a pamphlet published in London which spoke of the Episcopal North Church in Boston, and it noted that there was another Anglican church in town, King's Chapel. In mid-1760s, the town of Boston voted to maintain the North Church clock, or the Old North clock, and we know that the other North churches or North meeting houses did not have clocks, and there are other mentions in town records, and of course, Reverend Twain also pointed to the most famous image of Boston from this period. It shows all of the churches, an engraving done by Paul Revere in 1768, which very clearly shows this building as the tallest, not only in the North End, but in the entire town. And the Reverend Wayne went a step further and said, if you look at how high the tower of this building is compared to the towers of the other North churches, you would see a light from those belfries would not have reached Charlestown, which was, of course, the purpose of hanging lanterns up there in 1775. And Reverend Wayne has a, a wonderful sentence in this sermon he gave here, marking, I think, the 175th anniversary of the building. The superstition that a man who has written a book is a great authority on almost all points has not yet entirely died out. And I do applaud Reverend Wayne for combating that particular superstition, and I encourage all of us to continue doing that just because someone has written a book. And so the Reverend Wayne pretty clearly shows, and I think it's uh, and using good history, good historical evidence, and not just the propensity of an historian to bring up facts that he thinks no one else knows, and therefore this makes the historian smarter than everyone else in the room, but actually looking at the meaning of the term church, the term meeting house, as well as the town records that pretty clearly show this was the North Church. And it was the place where the lanterns were hung. And thus there can be a marker on the front of the tower announcing this fact to the world. So put any doubt out of your mind, this might not be the place, or this might not have been called Old North because it's Christ Church and we know the Mathers were Old North and not the Anglicans. Now, just as historians should not pick fights with ministers, we probably also should not get into arguments with poets. But, of course, we do. It's really the reason that in the 1870s there was an interest on the part of this congregation to put an announcement of the lantern story on the front of the church was because in 1860, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who was perhaps the most well-known American poet, if not the best-known American man of letters, had written what was perhaps his best-known poem, or what would become his best-known poem, on the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And we will be seeing a dramatization of this. I'm also going to talk a bit about that poem, which, as you all should know, is really not very good history. And it's probably not even very good poetry. I mean, who am I to judge? Um, Edgar Allan Poe had a great deal to say about Longfellow as a poet, thinking but the Pope, he was a bad poet and he was a plagiarist. In fact, Poe had a, I, I don't know, somewhat blasphemous to be standing in a pulpit in Boston talking about Edgar Allan Poe. Um, but it is a terrific story that Longfellow writes in his poem. And he really fixes the place of Old North in our consciousness as this building really becomes a central character in this poem. Now, the, the poem only mentions three individuals. Of course, Paul Revere and his friend. Does anyone know the other one? Dawes is not mentioned in the poem. 
Perhaps he should have been. Again, we, we, we can spend the rest of the night picking apart the things that Longfellow gets wrong. That might be entertaining, but really wouldn't be fruitful. So just, I'm not going to keep asking you questions about the poem. I'll share it with you, and then we'll all know. We'll all have the same text in mind. This is, I think, the format of a good sermon, where you begin with text, and then we explain. Um, I'm waiting wait to see if Reverend Ayers gets up and shakes his head and says, oh, this is a format. <laughs> Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that fateful day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft from the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One, if by land, and two, if by sea, and I, on the opposite shore, will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and armed. Then he said good night and with muffled oar silently rode to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay, where, swinging wide at her mooring, lay the Somerset, a British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by her own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend, through alley and street, wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men by the barracks door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the steady tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed the tower of old North Church, by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters which round him made masses and moving shapes of shape, by the trembling ladder steep and tall to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath, in the churchyard, lay the dead in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in a silence so deep and still that he could hear the sentinel tread of the watchful night winds that went creeping along from tent to tent, seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead, for suddenly all his thoughts are turned away to a shadowy something far away where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide, like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride on the opposite shore, walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now gazed at the landscape far and near, then impetuous, stamped the earth and turned and tightened the saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old north church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and silent and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns. He lingers and gazes still full on his sight. A second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles and passing a spark. That was all, struck out by a steed, flying fearless and fleet, and yet through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding that night, and the spark struck out by the steed in his flight soon kindled the land into flame with its heat. He's left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep as the mystic, meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft in the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford Town. He heard the crowing of the cock and the barking of the farmer's dog and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. 
He saw the gilded weathercock bathed in moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, blank and bare, gazed at him with a spectral stare as if they already stood aghast at the frightful work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord Town. He heard the bleeding of the flock and the twitter of birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadow's crown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest in the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each rock and farmyard wall, chasing the British down the lane, crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees by the edge of the road, only pausing to fire and load. And so through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on that night wind of the past, through all our history, through the last, in the hour of darkness, of peril, of need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurry and hoofbeat of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. So the poem is in the present tense. This is Revere rides. Revere continues to ride. And the poem has this message. I'm sorry, the historian, after finishing even the most delightful and intriguing work of art, will then start talking and giving you his or her interpretation of it. It's one of the many things that I think normal people should distrust in historians, but so you have this present tense story, Revere continues to rock, and Longfellow does, he, he's not writing history, and I think that is one of the essential things we need to remember whenever we're looking at a work of art or even a work of um, commerce that is using history for some other method. And so Longfellow is having Revere as the central character, along with his friend who wanders through the streets trying to find out which direction the British are going, as well as that unfortunate third character who at the bridge would be first to fall. And while Revere and his friend are here, this man is still asleep in his bed out in Concord. And Revere's friend actually takes up three stanzas of the poem. In fact, you begin the poem, and you do have Revere rolling across the Charlestown, and then he disappears for four stanzas until he comes back impetuous, wanting to mount and ride. And then you have the Old North Church, which plays the central role here. If it were not here, you couldn't have the poem. I don't, I'm not going to say if the Old North did not exist, there would not have been a revolution. Um, there's actually a poem by a fellow, Jonathan Trumbull, the um, artist. He wrote a poem called McFingal. I don't know if anyone read McFingal here. I don't think that there is a edifice in the country where people come every day here because every day because Trumbull wrote McFingal. Just think about it. Think about the chance of Longfellow climbing this tower sometime in 1860 and getting intrigued with this story and looking up the Revere narrative that Revere wrote for Jeremy Belknap in the 1790s when Belknap asked him, what do you remember about April 18th and 19th of 1775? And the Massachusetts Historical Society has Revere's account of that night. And Revere had kept a memorandum because, of course, Revere was doing this on behalf of the behest of the Committee of Safety, and he did turn in his expense accounts to them. You know, he had to hire a horse, and I'm not saying this indicated that Paul Revere was simply doing this because someone was paying him. It was a great undertaking, but uh, horses do need to be fed, and Revere, as you know, had a large family, and Longfellow had Revere's account. And actually, our friend Frothingham, the historian, also took Longfellow to task for using Revere's account instead of the account of Richard Devens, who was a member of the Committee of Safety and had a lot to say about what the Committee of Safety had been doing in the days before this. You know, a poet makes choices, just as historians make choices about what they will cover. So, we have Old North as a figure here. 
And in the first stanza, Revere tells his friend, if the British do march out by land or sea, hang a lantern aloft. And then, you know, one, if they're going by land, that is along uh, the neck, and then through Brookline over to Cambridge. Two, if they're going by sea, that is, if they're getting on their boats at the edge of the common and going across the back bay. Of course, you should have said across the back bay, but can you imagine that? One, if they're going by the neck, two, if they're going by the back bay, that's really <laughs> not much of a poem. And so you have Old North Church in the first stanza, and then in the second stanza you have the Somerset. You have these two structures here, this church, and then the British warship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar. Uh, great imagery. And then we have stanza four in the tower of Old North Church. The first stanza, you probably notice, he says, the North Church Tower, not the Old North Church. And it's hard to say if in 1775 this would have been considered the Old North Church, and it was then about 50 years old, when the Old North Meeting House at this point was about 100 years old. So um, that's a question for, I suppose, the next Frothingham to come along and grapple with. And then you have the Old North Church in stanza six, as Revere is looking at it from across in Charlestown. It's lonely and spectral and silent and still. And then, of course, the next meeting house we encounter is in Lexington. And that meeting house is also blank. Its windows are blank and bare and gazing out with a spectral stare. This image of a specter here, the specter of the meeting house, the specter of the uh, meeting house in Lexington. But then you also have from the North Church of Tower, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. <coughs> really striking imagery here. Um, actually, as I'm thinking about it, it's a better poem than I was saying when I started. Um, so, it's a very important for the poem, and this is why I suppose Old North, deservedly so, it's more attention here, and it is really one of the central icons of this revolutionary struggle. And Longfellow does manage to capture much of it in this poem, the spark that will set the land into flame with its heat. And then that wonderful last verse about in the hour of darkness, of peril of need, the people awake and listen to hear that hurrying hoofbeat of the, the steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. You know, there's a legend in England about Sir Francis Drake's drums being heard when Mother England is in danger. I don't know any of you in your English and can verify that. But, um, again, it's a source of national identity. And Longfellow was writing this at the very time the nation is breaking apart. And in breaking apart, the nation is really born. And you know, Longfellow himself was a pacifist. And he, he was against slavery. I, he, I, I suppose he uh, was a friend of Charles Sumner. I'm a little leery of calling him an abolitionist in the sense that Garrison or uh, James, John Greenleaf Whittier were abolitionists. As Longfellow was a more peaceable man, and a member of the Harvard faculty. And members of the Harvard faculty were, at least in the good old days, did not go in for fanatical campaigns. So Longfellow does get a lot right here, but remember, he's not writing a history. He is writing for another purpose, to awaken a nation to this shared history, this shared culture. Now, there is some irony in the fact, of course, that what becomes the central church icon of the revolution is an Anglican church. As much of the pre-revolutionary rhetoric and agitation came from the Congregational Churches. Jonathan Mayhew, a Congregational Minister at the Old West Meeting House in 1750, had been really angered when he learned that the Anglicans in Boston were preparing on the end of January to observe the Saints' Day of one of the Anglican Saints. The Congregationalists, for those of you who don't know, is anyone a Congregationalist I should ask before I started bashing them? No one wants to admit it. 
and congregation sexes. Did you know the Reverend Ayers and I are both watching? We'll begin the conversion attempt. But, no, the Anglicans were going to observe the saint's day for Charles I, who was a saint in the Anglican Church. And of course, the Congregationalists, their ancestors had come here barely a century earlier to get away from Charles I. And now the Anglicans, who had taken root in 1688, were going to celebrate his Saint's Day. And Reverend Mayhew spent a month of sermons blasting this whole idea saying that Charles I was a bad man, and how can you be a bad man and also a saint? He granted that he was martyred, uh, well, killed anyway, but it was uh, for good reason, uh, Reverend Mayhew said. More importantly in the sermon, the sermon isn't just an attack on Charles I, the attack was on the very idea of kingship. More importantly, Mayhew advances this idea that ordinary people are in a position to judge the rulers. And the men and women who had left England to get away from Charles I had cast their judgment on Charles I for good reason. He elaborates it. And this is a very important point. The people judge their governors. And that we should venerate the king was heresy to the Reverend Mayhew, a point he elaborates in this sermon. Um, there was an internet rumor a few years ago that Reverend Mayhew also coined the term taxation without representation is tyranny, but I understand that's actually not true. He does, however, advance this idea about people judging their governors, having a fundamental right to sit in judgment on those who govern them. And if they are found wanting, the way Charles I was, they can um, remove them. In fact, this is one of the points that people, thinking people in England will use to argue that people in Boston are really kind of whacked, but they have these strange ideas, and their ideas are thundered at them from their pulpits. One member of Parliament during the years before the Revolution is telling other members of Parliament about how irrational people in Boston are. He said, I knocked on the door and asked the servant to open the door, I want to see your master. And you know what she said? I have no master but Jesus Christ. How can you deal with people who have this misguided sense of their own relationship to God, the fact that they can judge everyone, even those who are better than them? Later in the next century, another English visitor would write a book blasting the Americans saying that every American thinks he or she is just as good as anyone else. And how can you have any kind of society where people think this? She has a whole chapter on how difficult it is to find good domestic help in America for this very reason. Anyway, uh, enough about Mrs. Trollo. You, so you have this sense here of this thunder from the pulpits, which is one of the things triggering this difficulty between Great Britain and these colonies here. Um, a uh, British diarist wrote that the king had Boston on the brain. Now, as I said, something of an irony that it's an Anglican church that remains, the Congregationalist churches are gone, and at first there really was great antipathy between the Congregationalists and the Anglicans. When the first Anglican church was planted here in 1688, it caused great upset, turmoil, and in fact, a revolt. And um, the first Anglican minister, I don't know, do you know this, Steve, about the first Anglican minister here came in the mid-1680s, and he did give his, hold his first services at the then the townhouse, where the old state house is now. And people did go to hear him because they'd never heard an Anglican service before. And someone said, some, someone referred to him as Baal's priest, B-A-A-L. Um, you know, if you know nothing else about the Old Testament, you should know that if someone refers to a minister as Baal's priest, it's not a good thing. It's one of the pagan gods of Babylon. So it's not as though, gee, the Anglicans have a slightly different theology than we do. It's that they're simply dead wrong. And in fact, they're heretical. And then someone else said, 
that this sermon reeked of leeks and garlic. So this is 1688. By the 1720s, things had come, tensions had eased, and in fact, the first minister of this church was Timothy Cutler, who had been ordained first as a congregational minister. He actually had been the rector at Yale a College in Connecticut, and really was a heavyweight in congregationalist circles when he converted to Anglicanism and went to England to be ordained as an Anglican minister, specifically for this church, which is then a building here in the North End. And you also see in the 1720s, 1730s, more of what we would call ecumenicalism, that is collaboration among the clergy here. When those first Anglicans were here in the 1680s, they built King's Chapel, because initially the idea was, we can share. So if there is a meeting house, well, the congregation, the Anglicans have their services earlier, and then after we're done, the Congregationalists can come in. And the governor was ordering this, which didn't really sit well with some of the clergy. They tried it out, and the Congregationalists claimed that the Anglican services went on too long. They were supposed to be done by 10 o'clock, but they keep us waiting out in the cold because people want to talk to the minister and do other things, and they must give really long sermons. I don't know if anyone's, no one's here the Congregationalists, so you don't know what their sermons were like at this time, but complaining about someone else's sermon seems to be very ill grace on the part of the Congregationalists. But anyway, more ecumenicalism in the 1720s, and more actually respectable congregationalists going over to the Anglican way. And in fact, Mather Biles Jr., who was the minister here at the time of the Revolution, was related to Cotton Mather. That is, a Mather, one of the sisters of Increase Mather was the grandmother of Mather Biles, so a family relationship here. And Mather Biles Sr., that is the father of the minister here, actually was a congregational minister at the Hollis Street Church, or Hollis Street Meeting House. Um, both, of the, both of the Bileses, Mather Sr. and Jr., remained loyal to the British Crown. And Mather Biles Jr. left Boston on March the 17th of 1776. And his father, the congregationalist, left Boston, but then came back, and was rather surprised when he came back just a year or two later, that he was held in suspicion and, in fact, had his pulpit taken away from him for having been loyal to the crown. He was actually, excuse me, a man with some wit. He was living basically under house arrest, uh, attended by his daughter. His only son was Mather Jr who at this time was living in exile up in uh, Canada. And so the senior Biles, and then was a man in his 70s, was living in his home, and there was a sentinel posted outside the house. And Mather Biles Sr. referred to the sentinel as my observatory. <laughs> then the next minister here had actually been a chaplain to Burgoyne's army which was captured at Saratoga in 1777. And of course, this convention army was marched to Boston, and he elected to stay here. The, after the junior Biles had left, there was a vacancy here, so Reverend Steve Lewis became the minister here. So again, a town or a congregation that will accept a former chaplain in the British Army just as the ministers were children or sons of congregational ministers, shows that there is something else at work here. Um, minister in the late 70s, in the 1790s, actually was a Harvard graduate. His father was a congregational minister in Roxbury. I'm almost tempted to ask Reverend Ayers if his father was a congregational minister, as this seems to be, no, he wasn't, but uh, seems to be a pattern here. And you have something happening here, as I said, a more of an ecumenical spirit. And even in the early 19th century, the lay readers here were congregational theology students. So this is quite an interesting transformation here, as we see Old North representing really a breakdown of these schismatic lines, these religious lines, which had divided people in the 17th and 18th centuries, even to the point of bloodshed. You know, one reason 
Charles I was a martyr because the Puritans didn't like him. So it's not an insignificant thing that you have sons of congregational ministers here, even a British chaplain here, and a spirit of, of at least inquiry and cooperation among these different ministers. And they have some extraordinary events here in the 18th century. For four successive Sundays here in 1736, Charles Wesley preached from his pulpit. Wesley is really the founder of what becomes Methodism. He's also a great writer of hymns. Everyone here knows at least one Wesley hymn. Does anyone know one? Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And another one, an Easter song, Christ the Lord is risen today. And he wrote about 600, he wrote hundreds of hymns. Again, the power of music is uh, extraordinary in moving religious ideas. In the fall of 1740, George Whitfield attempted to preach here, but so many people crowded in, they moved this to the common. Of course, Wesley, who is an Anglican minister, is one of the founders of Methodism. Whitfield is the great evangelist of the 18th century. He was ordained as an Anglican minister, but then can't get a pulpit, so he preaches outside to thousands of people. And it's his visit in the 1730s, 1740s that's part of the spark of what we call the Great Awakening. And after he leaves Boston, having preached to thousands of people on Boston Common, he goes out to Northampton where he and Jonathan Edwards are part of a revival movement. This spark, which changes a religious direction here as you bring together people of different denominations into a spirit of faith. And actually making this religious enthusiasm, which the British uh, actually members of Parliament saw with some fear, as a servant who says, I have no master but Jesus Christ, makes it safe for a republic. In July of 1776, actually the very day that the Declaration of Independence was being read from the old state house, here in um, this church, they're actually the vestry are discussing, well, we should really take out the prayers and the liturgy praying for the king and the royal family. Actually, there had been a demonstration at another Anglican church when those prayers were read at Trinity Church, when they read the prayers for the king and the royal family, and people began protesting. And it's usually a very bad sign when people in a church start protesting <laughs> the liturgy. So they did actually take excise those bits. And then in the 1780s, the, all of the Anglican churches get together to um, make the liturgy safe for a republic. So this is really the story here of this transformation happening in the churches here, especially this one. And it's this glimmer and then gleam of light that Longfellow and Revere see from the Belfry Tower, which is really the important thing, and not the antiquarian questions that uh, Frothingham was raising so much uh, fuss about, whether it might have been another meeting house and so on. And here in Old North, in Christchurch, the Anglicans of the 18th century were beginning to live peacefully among congregationalists and joining with others. You know, the other, one of the other Anglican churches in town, King's Chapel, becomes a Unitarian church. It's a blurring of doctrinal lines over which so much blood has been spilled elsewhere. And you see happening here, aside from the nice story we know from Revere, from Longfellow's poem, and the story we all could tell, it's really a story of something else, something much more profound and important. It's a concept of religious pluralism that comes very fitfully, slowly, to Massachusetts. But you really see it being born here. And over the next century, as the neighborhood, and as the city, and as the nation would change around this venerable building, you know, newcomers, who were neither Congregationalist nor Anglican would come to live in these narrow streets. And this idea, this freedom they would have, would allow them all to embrace this building and all it represents.
preserving Old North, Christ Church, and the tradition which had been developed here. So it's not an antiquarian message, but it's a living message, as Longfellow's is a living message, and as the message of this building's namesake is a living message. And both would have understood it, as here we can create a common identity, Tory and Patriot, Anglican, Congregationalist, Catholic and Jew, here in the North End of Boston. And actually one of my most vivid memories of this building is bringing a group of students here. And this was at a time when I was seeing this primarily as an historic artifact. And a number of the students were from Saudi Arabia. And what they were struck by was, this is a Christian church. It was the first time any of them had been inside one. And what they were noticing was the pulpit, because they had seen similar pulpits in mosques, and the Ten Commandments, and other things that they would recognize. I remember one of them, uh, Ali Al Abbas, turning to me, and, and in fact, his family had a business, their business was actually in buses in Saudi Arabia, bringing pilgrims to Mecca. And this was his first time inside a religious building that was not Muslim. And he said to me, are there Jewish places like this in Boston? And I said, yes, there are. He said, can we go to one? We did. He realized that here, in America, it's possible to do something that's not possible in many other parts of the world. And it's something this spirit that emerges here, I suppose the builders of it would have called it a providence or a grace. We, in our more secular age, may try to apply other names to it, but we should all cherish it. And we all should pray, as the founders did, that the gates of hell shall never prevail against it.
Yes. Were they exhausted? These are trained soldiers. I mean, this is what they do. They are good at this. So it's not as though you would, if, if suddenly we say to this group, okay, we're now going to march out to Lexington and conquer. These are trained soldiers, and this is what they're trained to do. Um, so, no. Um, and they're doing a simple, you know, Bunker, the, 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 the Bunker Hill campaign, their real objective was not to get Breed's Hill. Their real objective was to get to Cambridge, to Harvard Square, by the end of the day. And then the next day, to sweep through Roxburgh. And the rebels had fortified Bunker Hill. Just as another example of this, maybe people were in better shape than we are. Henry Knox, who was not a small man, in fact, he weighed about 300 pounds, he visited Washington at his headquarters at the same time he was overseeing fortification at Dorchester Heights. One day, he walked between Dorchester Heights and South Boston, well, not South Boston, and Washington's headquarters near Harvard Square by way of Roxbury and Brookline twice. I keep thinking that we historians should probably try to do something like that. You know, try to do it once, walk one way once, that uh, we would be worn out. So maybe people were in better shape. Other questions? Yes? No. It takes a while. Yeah. The Mathers Church was either the second meeting house or the north meeting house, because they was used either age or location. So there was a west, there was a south. But then when they build a new one, that one becomes the new one. And then they, so there was the north meeting house, and then they built a new one, the new north meeting house, and this one becomes the old one. And I think, I suspect, and this would require more um, archival digging, find out when this building probably would not have been called, I don't know if it would have been called Old North before the Old North Meeting House had been knocked down in December of 1775, because that was older. And so this one becomes older as the others all disappear. Good question, though. And of course, um, those of you who are not from Boston, Old South Meeting House is the venerable museum on Washington Street, Old South Church, is a 19th century building in Copley Square. And we also, I, I've given talks at the old state house and people I know said they couldn't find it because they went to Old City Hall, Old South, the state house. It's our propensity for trying, deliberately trying to confuse people. Yes, you your hand up. Oh yes, there were. This is actually in places where there were more religious denominations. You see more of that than here. And in fact, this is something that happens in the 18th century, as um, people come from European communities where there's only one religion. So you really, uh, one could be the Christian or Jews were really constrained in Europe. Here, you know, they don't have ministers for every denomination, so ministers have to travel around. They can't catechize everyone. And there are fewer people from, say, um, Presbyterians or Anglicans or Congregationalists. So, yes, there is a much more intermarriage. And also people shop around. If they don't like this minister's preaching, they'll go to another church because they have that option here. And actually, a minister in Pennsylvania, he's actually uh, a German, um, says, you'd rather be a shepherd in Germany than a minute pastor here. Because everyone here thinks, you know, well, we built the church. We raised the money for it. Therefore, we hire the minister. If you don't like the minister, either we'll fire him, which happens quite a bit, or we'll go to another church. And you read the, the, the histories of these towns, these churches, it's constant fighting between the ministers and the vestry particularly the ministers who come from Europe, where the idea is, you know, the minister is the one who tells us. Here we think, well, we pay him. So we tell him. It's a much different idea. See, yes, there is a lot of intermarriage, and that is also going to be a blur of the lines between denominations. Yes? Twelve o'clock, one o'clock. 
to a club. No. Revere doesn't, Revere doesn't make it to Concord. And so he has him riding by the bridge. No. He does, he's in, he, it does leave Charlestown around 11. And so, again, Longfellow is, um, I don't know, like, again, just as try walking from South Boston to um, Cambridge, maybe we should get a horse and see how long it takes to ride from Lexington to Concord. Does it take an accident? No? Yes, have you done this? Yes. Yeah. We know it's we know it's around six between six and seven when the British troops reach Lexington Green. They reach Lexington. And the militia actually had been waiting most of the night because they got the alarm sometime around midnight one. So they turn out. Then they spend much of the night waiting in the Buckman Tavern. And then um, the, this is the first encounter. That may be a misnomer. Uh, again, there are arguments about where was the first battle, where was the first shot fired, and other things. You know, the other famous poem from this period is Emerson's um, by, the, by the Rude Bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmer stood, fired the shot that ran the world. The foe long since in silence slept, the conqueror too in silence sleeps. And time, the ruined bridge is swept down the dark stream which seaward creeps. By this green bank, by this soft stream, we set today a votive stone that memory may their deed redeem when, like our sires, our sons are gone. Spirit, who bid these heroes dare to die and leave their children free, bid time and nature gently spare the shaft we raise to them and thee. And it's a poem really about memory and about the time when, like our fathers, our sons are gone. But I've seen Lexington uses that phrase, the shot heard around the world, that comes out of Emerson's poem about Concord. If anyone here is from either Lexington and Concord, you probably know about this rivalry between these two towns. Um, it's a wonder that they united to fight the British. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is actually something the British didn't think that Lexington conquered. Well, what about Massachusetts and Virginia? How are these people going to cooperate? And in fact, one of the British generals, uh, Sir Henry Clinton, said, well, what we should do is just pull up all of our forces to um, Canada and Florida and let these people fight it out. And after they're tired of killing each other, they'll ask us to come back. And, yeah, the prospect of these Americans uniting and working together seemed really distant to um, the British, almost impossible, and what a difficult thing. It still is. You know, we don't always agree with each other. We've learned not to fight it out, but, you know, Lexington conquered. I'm sorry, this is a distraction. Yes? Yes. Dawes and Revere set out from Boston. They alert other people who then carry the message further. Yes, yeah. Yeah, David Hackett Fisher's book, which is a great book in many ways about this whole period. And you could you can write books based on what he has in the appendices to his book. He compiles what the tides were like in Boston, the phases of the moon, and other things that uh, he's an extraordinary scholar. So um, there's a fellow named Preston, and there are others who are being, you know, carrying this message. And then throughout the colonies, in fact, there are other messengers like Revere. And the, um, and the State Archives and the Commonwealth Museum, they actually have one of his bills that he submitted after a ride later to carry news somewhere. And it's on the back of it, his bill, you know, he's billing for this. It has to be signed by all members of the Committee of Safety. I don't know if Revere had to go around to get James Otis, Samuel Adams, John Adams, John Hancock to sign this. I remember Professor Fisher and I were looking at this and he said, we didn't even have a government and we already had a bureaucracy. <laughs> Any other questions or thoughts? Well, thank you. Uh, while they're doing that, I might add my uh, own quick uh, 
postscript to uh, Bob's comment about the uh, congregations feeling free to fire their clergy. Um, my favorite part of the Old Norse story uh, is that the lanterns were hung on Tuesday of Easter week. It was the church's tradition to uh, hold their annual meeting the, the day after Easter, because everybody would be around, everybody was in church that day. And they summoned the Reverend Mather Biles Jr. to meet with the vestry. Um, he was unhappy because uh, once the Port of Boston was closed, the congregation couldn't pay their pew rents and they didn't pay him. Uh, and he had been out looking for another job. He did not come on that Monday, so they adjourned the meeting till Tuesday. And we don't have the precise best few minutes, um, but I think the conversation probably went, we hear you have another job offer, you better take it. Um, we're not sure whether he was fired or whether he quit, but um, it was uh, pretty close. He had a job offer in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, but uh, one of the best few members, uh, Captain John Pulling, uh, was one of, uh, of two people um, that uh, a war has were in the steeple that night. Uh, with a lantern, also the church sex in Robert Newman. So uh, if it weren't for the firing of my predecessor, uh, the American uh, Revolution may never have started.